Alarm clocks, am I right? <laughs> Who likes them? I don't. <laughs> no one wants to wake up. I'm curious, how many of you hit the snooze uh, every morning when, you sit, when your alarm goes off? Uh, why don't you head over to the comments and just tell me how many times. Like, do you typically hit the snooze one, one time, two times, three times, 17 times? <laughs> I always think, man, I just want to get more sleep. Oh, I'm telling you what, things are going crazy in our country, aren't they? I mean, it is, it is the, the strangest season, and alarm bells, really, are going off in our country. Uh, we, we started with the, the pandemic, and all of the health concerns that came from that. Man, we didn't know, you know, who was going to be okay, and were, were people going to die? Were people in our family or people that we care about going to die? It seems like uh, at first we thought, oh, it's only certain ages, but then we realized, well, wow, all ages can be affected by the virus. Oh, so terrible. And if that weren't enough, then we had the stay-at-home order. And that really changed everything about our lives. It changed the way we go to school, the, change we, the way we work, it changed our, our relationships. It, it really changed so much that I don't know any, if anyone could have even anticipated all the ripple effects of just the stay-at-home order. Then, of course, there's all the economic ripple effects that happen because everyone's staying at home, uh, no one was operating businesses, so the travel industry, the hospitality industry, restaurants, uh, industry after industry has been affected so badly. So, I mean, it, it, everything was, was not normal. And then, in the midst of all that, it seemed like in just a short amount of time, we saw shocking stories and photos and videos of death after death. There, there was uh, Breonna Taylor, then Ahmad Arbery, and then on Memorial Day, George Floyd was murdered, and the nation watched in shock and awe. And, and I, I don't know if there's a person in our country who's not been affected in some way. Uh, we feel grief, well, we feel anger, we feel outrage, we feel uh, powerlessness. We, we, we feel uh, um, numb. One person said to me, I feel numb to my bones. What, what a strange, strange time. Black people are afraid for their children, and they are afraid for their very lives. And I, I don't know if anyone says it better than Kedron Bryant. Let's take a look at that video. I'm a young black man Doing all that I can To stand Oh, but when I look around And I see what's being done to my kind Every day I'm being hard to this prey My people don't want no trouble We've had enough strong I just want to live, God protect me, I just want to live, I just want to live. I just want to live, that's what we all want. And all of a sudden, once again, racial injustice is at the forefront of all of our minds in our nation. It's what we're all focused on right now. It's front and center. What is injustice? Injustice is violation of the rights of others. It is unjust or unfair action or treatment. Racial injustice is evil. It is sin. It is horrific. I have an African-American pastor friend who posted a video on social media that he created this, this past week in which he was uh, pleading with all of his friends, protect your children. And he, he started talking about the way he has coached his sons on what to do if they are confronted by a policeman. And I, I just sat there mesmerized and 
just trying to take it all in as he was, was telling his sons and telling his friends, stay calm no matter what. Just stay calm. Think about getting home and then we'll, we'll deal with it from there. Don't make any sudden moves. Do not reach for your cell phone. Don't reach for anything. Strictly obey every command. And as you do, repeat the command verbally out loud, slowly. And it strikes me, I, I've never had to have that kind of a conversation with my two sons. Our church is reading through the book of Revelation. And I, I don't know if you like to geek out on this kind of thing, but I, I looked at the root word, that, uh, the Greek word that means revelation. You know what it is? Apocalypse. So we're reading through the apocalypse <laughs> in the Bible as a church. And we're looking out our front window, and we're looking at our TV and our, our computer screens, and it's like we are living through the apocalypse right now. The Holy Spirit seemed to shine his light on one particular verse uh, for me in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. And Jesus was speaking to the church of Laodicea, and it was a very indifferent church. It was a church that thought it had it all going on, but Jesus saw something different. And in verse 19, this is what he said. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. And as I read that sitting in my chair at home, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, Garen, that verse is for you. This is what I'm saying to you today, Garen. Be diligent and turn from your indifference. And I realized it was a holy moment. God's trying to get a hold of me. So I got out my journal, and I started writing and said, okay, Lord, tell me what's, what's going on. What do you see? And what I realized is that when tragic events happen, I grieve and I feel sad, but I don't do anything. That is indifference. Jesus said, be diligent and turn from your indifference. That word, be diligent, means to be zealous. It means to get passionate about something, to get involved, uh, to especially uh, to be enthusiastic for a cause. And he says, turn from your indifference. That's, that's just one word in the original languages. Turn from your indifference is the word repent. It means do a 180. Feel regret about how you've been thinking or acting, and have a change of self, a change of heart and mind that results in a new self and new behavior. So many times we feel sad for a time, but then nothing changes. We don't have a new self. I can't speak for everybody, but I am a white male. And so many times white people think, I'm not racist, so it's not my battle. I don't want to get involved in someone else's battle. But what we don't understand is that we all contribute to the racial injustice in our country, either through, through things that we do or things we allow. And as, as white, uh, white Americans, we are conditioned to be oblivious to all the ways that we have inherited advantages head starts, and even the upper hand. We, we, we don't even see it. We can't see it. We have been trained and conditioned to not be able to see it. We assume everybody must have the same privileges, access, and freedoms, but they don't. The prevailing system doesn't allow for that. People of any skin color sometimes believe that somehow if we just stay silent, we'll stay safe. But if our world is not safe for one group of people, then it's not safe for anybody. No matter what we look like, sometimes we don't initiate conversations because we don't want to say the wrong thing. Saying the wrong thing can cost a person his or her job. It can cost a relationship. 
And I, I've noticed a lot of my friends are writing positive, thought-provoking articles and posting them on social media. And I, I've, I've appreciated those. I've grown uh, as, I've, as I've listened, as I've read, and, and um, I've seen different sides of things and realized how complex all these issues are that we're dealing with. But I gotta say, it's a lot harder to have a conversation about racial injustice face-to-face with someone whose face looks different than yours. I've been trying that this week, and it's not as, it's not as easy as it sounds. We sometimes don't take relational risks because we're not aware of the rewards that are waiting on the other side of pressing through a difficult topic. Sometimes we feel powerless. Other times we feel overwhelmed, and then we do nothing. As the church, sometimes we miss the fact that we have an amazing window of opportunity right now to share the love and the hope of Jesus with people all around us who are hurting. Jesus said, he said, you could sum up the whole Bible with just two commands. The first one is love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And he said the second one is just as important and that is love your neighbor as yourself. See, everything hangs on love. So many times we are waiting and praying for even a favorable situation so we can share Jesus. Lord, open the doors. Lord, smooth the pathway. Lord, make it possible. Lord, make it easy for me to share Jesus and show the love of God. But maybe, just maybe, God might lead you to share the love of Jesus right now in an unfavorable situation condition, an unfavorable situation, despite a pandemic, despite uh, uh, an economic collapse, uh, despite racial injustice, that now is the time. Today we started a brand new series called For Such a Time as This. And that phrase comes from a part of the Bible, it's the book of the Bible called Esther. It's named after the hero. And so if you have a Bible, uh, why, don't you, why don't you turn to Esther chapter 4, and I'm going to be skipping uh, uh, some of the verses just for time and kind of moving on. If you have the Bible in your hand, then you can just read the whole story as you go along. But as, as you're looking for it, just find Esther in the table of contents and look for chapter 4. I want to give you the context of what's going on so you know what we're going to read about today. Esther was a young Jewish woman, and she was exiled. She was taken from her homeland in Israel, and she was taken to Persia. And this, this was happening five centuries before Jesus, so a long time ago. She was brought to the king's palace, and through a strange turn of events, she became queen, queen of Persia. However, she kept her ethnicity secret, and she didn't let anyone know that she was a Jewish person. Well, one of the high-ranking Persian government officials kind of had a grudge against her relative, Mordecai. And everyone knew that he, his, his ethnicity was out there. Everyone knew he was a Jewish man. Well, this official tricked the Persian king into signing a law decreeing the annihilation of all the Jews in the largest empire of that day. So it would be like death to all Jewish people in several countries in the Middle East and Mediterranean area. This story has uncanny parallels to what we're going through today. So Esther chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned about all that had been done, this decree that all Jews must be killed on a certain day, he tore his clothes, he put on burlap and ashes, and he went out into the city crying with a loud and bitter wail, protesting. That word's not there, but that's what he's doing. As news of the king's decree reached all the provinces, there was great mourning among the Jews. They fasted, they wept and wailed, and many people lay in burlap and ashes. Does this sound familiar to what we're going through today? So many people today are hurting, and our collective attention is focused on racial injustice, which was exactly what was going on in this time period. Down in verse 4, when Queen Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, her relative, you know, who was laying in burlap and ashes, wailing, she was deeply distressed. Listen to what she did. She sent clothing to him to to replace the burlap, but he refused it. 
surface solutions and band-aids, not going to do any good right now. Our issues are a lot deeper than that. We're going to need something deeper than band-aids to heal our land. We need an awakening to the reality of God. And we need his kingdom to come now. (laughs) Verse 5. Then Esther sent for Hathak, one of her uh, one of her workers. She, she ordered him to go to Mordecai and find out what was troubling him and why he was in mourning. So Esther's there in the palace. Everything's going great for her as far as she knows. More, in verse 7, Mordecai told this worker the whole story. Mordecai gave Hathak a copy of the decree issued in the city of Susa that called for the death of all Jews. And he asked Hathak to show it to Esther and explain the situation to her. He also asked Hathak to direct her, uh, to direct Esther to go to the king to beg for mercy and plead for her people. Healing begins when we begin to discuss the issues. I heard our 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 mayor, Mayor of Auburn, this week. Uh, as uh, we we had just finished a prayer meeting with her on the steps of City Hall, and uh, a citizen came up and um, was confronting her and she just graciously listened for the longest time so proud of her and she reiterated to him that even though he has a lot of demands nothing's going to happen until we get around a table and we find collaborative solutions and she said and I invite you to that table pretty cool Verse 10, then Esther told Hathak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's officials and even the people in the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king in his inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his golden, his gold scepter. And the king has not called for me to come to him for 30 days. So her, her Esther's, Queen Esther's relative says, you got to go to the king. She sends a message back to her relative. No one goes to the king. If I go to the king, it could be off with my head unless I'm invited. And he's not invited me for 30 days. Verse 13. Mordecai sent this reply to Esther. One of the most famous passages in the Bible. Don't think for a moment that because you're in the palace, you will escape when all other Jews are killed. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for just such a time as this. You know, it's not, uh, it's not unknown that the person in power feels powerless to resolve the tensions that we feel. To, to right the wrongs. Esther, this queen, hadn't been invited to see the king for 30 days, and, and she could have faced death for, for, for barging in there or for even asking for permission to talk to him. Yet someone stood up and challenged the status quo anyway. Mordecai spoke up, and he went to someone who did have the power to make a difference, and he asked, for her to make that difference. The powerful person, that's in this case Queen Esther, realized she was on the scene for just such a time as this. Good news. Esther seized this window of opportunity. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply back to Mordecai. Go and gather together all the Jews of Susa in this city and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will do the same. And then... Though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I must die. And so Esther joined in the fasting and prayer for three days. And then she just simply stood out in the hallway where the king might see her. He saw her and he, and he invited her in. So she made a special lunch for him a couple of days in a row, and then she asked him to save her people. She revealed who she was and asked him to save her people. And she was successful. The king listened. And she survived 
and all of her people survived. The Jewish people were not annihilated throughout the realm. It makes a huge difference when someone in a position of having the upper hand, someone who is in power, is willing to sacrifice their life if that's what it takes to help those in danger. The bottom line of this message is this. When you take a small step, you can make a big difference. When you take a small step, you can make a big difference. You just need to do it while you have that window of opportunity. Esther was a hero, and she risked her royal status to help the people she loves. But Jesus is the real hero. Jesus didn't grasp his divinity. He didn't say, these are my rights, this is my royalty. But instead, he took on the form of a servant. He took on flesh and bones and walked among us. Esther, this hero we read about in the Bible, she risked her life to save her generation. Jesus actually laid down his life on the cross to save all generations of people who will put their faith in him. I I just want to encourage you that any positive action that we take, that you take, that I take, should, should be rooted in Jesus' ultimate sacrifice for us. So in view of what he's done for us, in the power that he has provided for us, in the love that he has shown for us, we go out in that love, in that power, in that presence. God is love, and his unconditional love makes it possible for us to love others unconditionally. When you take a small step, you can make a big difference. So I want to ask you just to think for a moment now and and in in the, the, the hours and the days to come. What's one small step you could take as an apprentice of Jesus to be part of the solution? Well, here's some suggestions to get you started. First of all, you could just go sit at the feet of Jesus in prayer and listen And uh, just sit there. One of the things I do sometimes is I'll just sit palms up just to say, Lord, I'm listening and I'm, I'm ready to receive. What do you have for me to do? Lord, what's one small step I can take? Another option, get a book. Uh, there's, there's a book called The Third Option I would recommend to you. It's by Miles McPherson. Uh, you could watch a YouTube video like Systemic Racism Explained. And, and I, I posted it, I, I saw it on Elaine's Facebook page. I posted it on my personal Facebook page. You're welcome to go there. And it's just a great general primer about the systemic racism issue in our nation and, and how, how we got to be at this place. Another idea for you, start an honest conversation with someone who looks different than you do. And do it in love. I'd like to pray for you right now. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, I lift up our country to you. Lord, we are already in such pain. And now an old wound, a recurring wound, has been opened again. And Lord, as we we look across our country, we just see all the pain caused by racial injustice. And Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to end racial injustice in our nation, in our country. Lord, bring us back together. And I know really the only way we can come back together is around you, the Prince of Peace. And so I pray for a spiritual awakening in our country. Lord, I pray that people would look up, not with their fists raised at heaven, but with their palms open just to say, Lord, we need you. We need you right now. Lord, I pray for revival and awakening in our country. And I pray for racial justice. I pray for racial equality. I pray for racial reconciliation. Lord God, that every person would have the freedom to be who you made them to be. Lord, I pray that you would help us as the church followers of Jesus Christ, apprentices of you, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see the window of opportunity we have and to seize this window of opportunity. Help us, Lord, to reach out to someone who's hurting. And I don't know if I've talked to anyone who's not hurting right now. 
Help us, Lord God, to press past the pleasantries and to care and to show your love and to bring your hope to the people who need it most right now. Lord, I pray that you'd help us all to take a small step and make a big difference. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know where you are spiritually, but probably the most important reconciliation I, I want to invite you to is reconciliation in your relationship with God. He is a loving Father. That's what we've been learning in our, our online Bible studies. He is a loving Father who loves you and cares about you. You do not have to perform for Him. He loves you just as you are. And He invites you to relationship with Him through Jesus Christ. So I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus, to become His apprentice, and to begin to learn from Him, be with Him, be changed by Him. I, I want to invite you to a changed self that comes when you repent, when you do a 180. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin, all those things that harm yourself and others. Turn your life over to Jesus and let Him lead. It's just, just that simple. That's how it starts. That, that's how that relationship begins. So I'd love to coach you in a prayer right now and invite you to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So I'll just lead you. I'll, I'll speak a line, then you, you speak it after me, repeat it after me. But please don't say it to me. Prayer is talking to Jesus. Would you talk to him? And I'll just coach you along the way. Here we go. Jesus, you say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you uh, put your faith in Jesus today and prayed that prayer with me, I'm so glad. And I just want to invite you to head to the website and uh, just uh, go, go a little ways down the, the uh, homepage there and, and uh, click on the Connect Card button. And would you fill out enough information to let me know you made that decision today? At the bottom of the Connect card, it's, there's a little box for you to check that says, I made the decision to follow Jesus today. Would you check that box? And like I say, give me enough info so I can, I can email you back. And I want to encourage you and give you some next steps. Well, today, it's, it's very appropriate that we're going to be receiving communion. So hopefully you've already gotten your bread and your juice ready. And we're going to receive that together in just a moment. Communion is all about connection. That's really what that means. It's, it's connection uh, with God and connection with the body of Christ, which is people, the people who believe in Jesus. The bread is a symbol of Jesus' body. And he gave his body, he allowed it to be beaten and bruised and whipped for your healing. Praise his name. The, the juice is a symbol of Jesus' blood, which was shed so that you could have reconciliation with God, that your sins could be forgiven. He made the sacrifice so we could be forgiven and free and whole. The most important thing now is love. And I just want to repeat what, what Jesus said. The most important thing you can do is love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So in just a moment, we're going to pray. And I, I just want to encourage you that if there is a breach in your relationship with God, as we pray, would you ask forgiveness and ask God to, to repair that, that, um, that bridge between you and him. If there is a breach between you and another person or another group of people, would you, would you repent? Would you ask God to forgive you? And then make a plan to make it right as soon as you can. And if there's a breach in your love for yourself, I, I want to encourage you to give that to Jesus too and to ask him to help you see yourself as he sees you. He sees you wrapped in his love. And I want you to see you that way too. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much, Jesus, for what you did, for your body, for your blood, for the life you laid down on the cross 
so that we could be reconciled to you. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for all those things I've done, all those things that I I wish I had done, uh, the right things that have gotten in the way of my relationship with you. So I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I ask you to forgive us. Lord, I I ask you to forgive me uh, for the ways even this week I hurt my brother, I hurt my sister. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. I ask you to help me to make it right. Help me to take the the initiative, Lord. And Lord, I ask you to to help me accept myself. And for all of us who are praying, Lord, I ask you to help us to help to uh, accept and love ourselves. Help us to see ourselves the way you see us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you take that bread and uh, let's eat together. Mine's been sitting here for quite a while. So it's pretty dry. I'm not going to lie. But as we do, we're thankful for the body of Christ. And let's drink the juice. We're thankful for the blood of Christ. Thanks for participating today, everybody. Wow, what a, what a Sunday. Uh, I'm so glad you have been here with us today. If you're new with us, would you text new to NFC to 97000? Uh, we want to connect with you and know that you're you're with us today. Also, you can post those in the comments as you've been watching. Also, if you have a prayer request, we really want to be praying for you. That number is 253-733-1640. You can text that number. Text your prayer request. We pray. We are a church that prays together. So be praying uh, or be texting those in so we can be praying for you. Also coming up, you can still sign up for online Bible studies. It is not too late. Sign up for Bible studies. You can go to the app or the website and sign up. And uh, at nfc.church is a great place to do that. And right now, you can head over with your kiddos and you can uh, play the YouTube video for them right now and they can have an awesome time there's great singing it's so much fun my kids love it they dance around they clap clap off beat it's really awesome Uh, but I love that they are worshiping Jesus together with us and so that is a great thing hey we will see you next week right here same time have a great day bye-bye